Lender is a global events company that started as Rebecca Lender's vision for a new kind of event management company, one that moved beyond event production to provide creative strategy, knowledge, and leadership to turn an event blueprint into inspirational reality for each client. Learn more about Lender Global Events at lenderglobal.com. Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. Here are your hosts, BizBash CEO David Adler and Editor-in-Chief Beth Kormanick. Welcome to Gather Geeks. I'm Beth Kormanick, and David Adler is away today. Our guest is John Berger, who founded the event tech company Social Tables and sold it to Cvent in 2018. Our editorial staff named him a BizBash innovator in 2014, which was obviously a smart choice as he's continued to innovate and be a leader in the industry. At our conference last year in Washington, he spoke on a panel of event entrepreneurs, and now we're expanding that discussion. This is a candid version of Don. He shares where he messed up as a young founder being afraid of his board of directors, and other lessons he's learned. Being candid may reflect the freedom that comes with having survived your startup and sold it for a lot of money. Dan also discusses what makes a successful entrepreneur, tips for building a strong team, and the new non-tech venture in events that he's working on now. Let's listen. Tell us your story in, in sort of a more of an elevator pitch of this. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think you're alluding to the first biz bash event I went to. Yep. Um, I remember very clearly cause it was me and a couple of colleagues. We drove up to New York city, stayed at my mom's house, went to your show, didn't have any booth equipment. So we set up, we brought a whiteboard and a laptop and we set up shop at a biz bash New York event in the Javits center. It is amazing to think about that six years later, you know, we were acquired by the biggest event technology company in the world. It's only six years. Uh, yeah, I think that I think that oh Bizbash event was in 2014. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and you were you were definitely had we had you had a brilliant idea. Well, you know, the thing about the idea that I, I always say it's not about the idea; it's about how you execute. Yeah. And well, you were also driven. I was driven, and I, and I hate to say this, but I see a lot of entrepreneurs fail because while they may be driven, they don't get things done. And I think that's the difference between successful and unsuccessful entrepreneurs. Those that are successful just find a way to get something done. It's as easy as that. And as soon as you, you know, make a commitment to get something done, it's just about, you know, clearing the way and letting an entrepreneur roll with the punches. An example for that, even the most basic one, is like, even if your initial product doesn't have product market fit, it's about finding ways of getting to product market fit. And, you know, at Social Tables, Initially, we didn't have product market fit. The initial idea was to take social media profiles and overlay them on a seating chart to create a social seating chart. That idea didn't stick. The real need was around planning and collaboration. And we were lucky enough to ride the collaboration wave and really bring event planning into the future when it comes to collaborating with your team on a floor plan. Well, how early did you know that your initial plan didn't work? And how freaked out did it get you? I, I think... It wasn't about like, oh, this plan doesn't work. Let's throw it out the window and start new. It's about constantly iterating and being agile and changing it. So it's not like, I was just like, okay, people are using this feature. Let's move on to a new feature. It wasn't a big deal. And, you know, to this day, even though I'm no longer there, I have to remind people, Social Table is not just floor plan software anymore. It's floor plan software. Of course, it's part of Seven, but it's floor plan software. It's sales software. It's marketing software. All in one. You had great people around you. I did. And, and how did you develop these people and find these people to take the journey with you? Because the, I remember in, during the early business days, there was like couch surfing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think the key for us when it comes to people was I'm really, what's really important to me is effort. People who try. And a lot of people say they try, but they actually don't. And to me, trying is, I'm talking all the way to like the job interview and even the pre-job interview. So people who really make an effort are the people that I'm drawn to the most. And I was able to find people who put a lot of effort into their work. So when you're, how do you, how do you identify that? How do you see it? When someone, how do you, how do you prove that someone tries? The speed in which they work, their ability to adjust to change and new systems and new processes and creating them if they don't exist their lack of emotions when it comes to receiving feedback and honestly, like how many hours they put in. 
there's a whole movement now, like this anti-hustle porn movement. It's like hustle porn is referred to as, you know, showing off that you're working hard. And I think that I'm, that, that movement really, it's like um, Alexis Hohani and the guy behind Reddit is kind of talking about it a lot, kind of like the anti-Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary's all about working hard. Alexis, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and Gary was on my board of advisors, great guy. I think that's bullshit. Like, I think you got to work hard. Like, if you want to make it, you got to work hard. Like, I honestly, like, I, you know, so my whole thing is like, I want to see people working hard, losing less, losing sleep. Yep. Because that means they want it. Do you think that it's the incentive? And by the way, I'll just add, in sports, there's nothing wrong with, so you shouldn't be raising, you know, you shouldn't be lifting that much weight. You know, like. We, what's going until yeah, you what's break, the difference you know? between, Exactly. What's the difference between, like, pushing yourself at the gym and pushing yourself at work? One is mental, one's physical. But is it, what is the incentive? Is it? Money doesn't drive people. It doesn't. The incentive is as follows. So first of all, of course, money is there. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm That's really, a given that someone's I am really proud of rewarded. the fact that more than 200 individuals made a lot of money. No, more than 200 people made money off social tables. Well, let, let me sort of sort of throw in there that your sale to Cvent was reportedly at $100 million. I'm sure you can't say what that number is, yeah, I can't, I, but I have read somewhere. I can't confirm or deny that, but what's in the media has been generally it's unbelievable. true. It's been true. Yeah. Well, it's not if you think about it, because generally speaking, software companies like ours yep. get get five to six x multiples on revenue, and that's kind of on bookings, and that's where we were. We were so that that number anybody can kind of back into that number and figure yep. it out, and not and not be that surprised. Yep. But going but for, back, but for a business in Washington D.C., it's a big deal. Yeah, that is a huge. Deal. A, I think it's one of the biggest exits in the D.C. area. Yeah, the no. D.C. Washington D.C. Right, Virginia's got a lot of right. tech. Maryland's got a lot of tech. Wedding wire is obviously huge. Right, micro strategy. Yeah. AOL, yeah. Uh, C event. Yeah. But you know, what I was going to say before, is that like what we're we talking about? We're talking about about uh, incentivizing and yeah, why so people obviously are money so. is a thing. And two hundred, two, there were two hundred people in our cap table, so people made money. Some people made some really good money. The so obviously money is a thing, but it's not the thing. And we paid well. We weren't the best, you know, salary wise. But we gave people a sense of belonging. We gave people something to identify with. Working at social tables was something people want to say when they went to a bar. People walked into our pink, pink stained office. They were proud of being there. So we gave people a sense of identity and belonging. We gave people, we, we basically it was like throwing an accelerant on their job, right? It was like throwing few on their career. It was like just throwing freaking rocket fuel because you learn a year at social tables is like five years anywhere else. So you, we moved really fast and you just, we kept feeding you and feeding you responsibilities. A lot of people broke, but a lot of those that didn't. How did you know, how did you know the ones that would make it and the ones that wouldn't? You don't know. You know I, mean, I, haven't found, I haven't found a way to do that, to, to really identify that. Have you found people? I think that- accepting, accepting the fact that it, most people will, will break and, and cannot sustain a change in culture. Most people can't. So it's a, it's the few. Yeah. Most people, it's like, think about it, right? It's like some people like the vacation at a, on a beach. Some people like to vacation at a yoga retreat. Some people like to vacation in a European city. Some people like to stay on a vacation. Most people don't like to vacation in all places. You know, right. it's like people have their preferences. Right. The same thing is true about company culture. You know, company culture changes and most people are not going to want to stick around as it changes because it's not what they sign up for. But those that adjust are those that will get the rewards. And what is the um, percentage of the ones that make it? Your opinion. Based on our numbers, we had about 40% turnover on a yearly basis. 40%. And that's pretty good, right? Uh, it's terrible. We're losing- no, but isn't it good in, in, in the fact that you're weeding out people yeah. and that so, but the 40 probably gets less, That's right? that's No, not necessarily, but we, we always kept it between 30 and 40% on an annual basis. But the thing there, David, is if that's the case, then you need to have the systems in place to train people and get them to value quickly. And, I, and, and so you're not you know throwing away training resources. Institutional exactly. memory. Exactly. You can't, I mean, exactly. that goes away. So that just, you know, people need to make sure that they're, and we didn't do this. I'm just, you know, speak, you know speaking from an ivory tower, but you have to make sure that your onboarding systems and your training resources align to your turnover. You know, you have been a mentor to me actually in many ways. Wow. That's nice to hear. Thank and you. And that when I would call you and say, you know, what, how, do you, how do you deal with human resources? And you said, you, have you read the who book? Yeah, who's tell, a great book. Tell us why you recommended that book to well, me. Well, who's called, uh, it's called Who because it's not about, um, it's not about what you do, it's about who you hire. That's kind of the premise. It's um, a guy named Jeff Smart, and I forget the other guy. Um, great kind of book about hiring, and it talks a lot about how to identify, and, you know, those people during the hiring process. 
and what they talk about and, and they walk you through. And I use it to this day in the new venture I'm part of now of creating a scorecard for every job. And the scorecard clearly lays out the job's mission, the job's outcomes, and the skills required. So for example, you're a salesperson, your job is to sell, your outcome is to sell half a million dollars a year, and your skill is somebody who doesn't stop picking up the phone or whatever, or intellectually curious. So creating the scorecard and really being able to then align the job description and the scorecard, your internal metrics to the scorecard, and your interview to the scorecard. And at, to be as an entrepreneur, though, watching that carefully has got to have been... It's a lot of people start these things and they don't monitor it. You guys, did oh, you? I mean, that's a huge problem, right? I mean, a lot of people... This, the, the idea of program management, the idea where somebody's responsible for a program in a company is doesn't really exist in most smaller companies because they're always running around yeah, like chickens you know, with the exactly. Yeah. So having people monitor them and holding managers accountable to the systems you move put in place is really important. And the ways we did that, we did that a few ways. The first one is we had a weekly operational meeting where every manager reported on the metrics they had in front of. And all you were very disciplined in that. Very disciplined. And everybody sort of worked with each other as opposed to just to you as the CEO, or was it? Well, everybody reported to to each other, and and the goal was to have a dialogue around every single goal, a measurable goal. And have a dialogue around it, but you had to have the discipline as a CEO. Oh, I say. did it every single week. Yeah, because that the, the one thing we know with entrepreneurial CEOs, they're good at starting things, but they're not great at execution. They're not good at finishing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, no, I um, I'm your very, secret I'm sauce very diligent is that. about yeah. operation. Now, it's not. I don't get a lot of joy out of it. And what I realize now, you know, having reflected over the past, you know, a few years, obviously, decade of my life at social tables, is that oftentimes I try to be both mommy and daddy to the business, where I was like. In one sentence, in one breath, I'd be motivational and inspiring. And in the other, I'd be like, you know, the heavy and pushing people. And it's a, it comes off as inauthentic. So when, how do you prevent that? Yeah, I don't, I'm, I read my book because I don't know. I, I'm still working on it. I think the answer is having a partner who really handles operations for you, which is why they're COOs and they're CEOs. How are you in collaborating with a partner? Because you have to sort of give up some control if you have a partner that or do you still uh, that's part so you write a scorecard yeah <laughs> you write a scorecard where you say what you want and you, so you're basically monitoring yourself yeah in I that mean, way I, I think it's very difficult to be um to play both sides that's interesting um and i i'm i was so obsessed with like being good at everything that yeah. i did i that this blind spot for me was like hey you might be good at these things just because, just because you're good you at them. You think this from Jewish parents? So probably. I, well, I, was, I was raised by a single mom. A single my mom, mom was like oh mom and God. dad, right? So my mom was oh, like, so a, you, it's so, like a two in one. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, that's the only thing I knew. And yeah. I talk a lot about in the book, understanding your biology, where you come from, yeah, yeah. as part of like understanding your leadership identity. Yeah. And I had, so I was like, I was really struggling in, in understanding why do I feel like I'm being really hard with everybody and also kind of not, inspiring people in the way I want to inspire people. It's because I was doing both things. That's that that's a really good lesson for people. Yeah. So what is is there like a if for a, for a, for an event entrepreneur? Yeah. How do you sort of what's the headline Well, of it's that? the same thing like a client, right? I mean, think about like Marcy Bloom, I would imagine. Right. Marcy Bloom has, you know, Gabrielle. Who's one of the top wedding producers? Of course, yeah. So she got Gabrielle on her team. She's been there like for a decade or a little less. And, you know, Marcy is the visionary and Gabrielle executes. Yeah. It's the same thing, you know. I think Marcy's going to walk around. Of course she does, and she does her walkthroughs and all that. But I would imagine, I don't know this for a fact, I just happen to know these two individuals. I would, you know, she's not creating the spreadsheets. Right. She's talking to the client, right. closing the client, and then... And somebody else is doing yeah. all that. So yeah. for an event entrepreneur, I think it's about, and when you're running your business, you have a big, a big uh, if you have a relatively bigger business, you know, 10 people, you got to have a partner who keeps the train on, the trains on time. Of course, early on, you can't do that. Right, right, right. But you got to have a partner who keeps train. It can be chief of staff. It can be an Administrative assistant. Somebody that's going to be got to be somebody who's got to be the heavy right. to 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 enfor an enforcer, right? Right. So you could be inspirational, right? The, one of the other things that you taught me, and you know, that's what I believe that that I'm a boomer, and if you don't reach out to these new generations, you don't learn anything. I mean, that's, that's right. a secret uh, that I think that, like you talked me talked told me about Upwork. <laughs> Oh, I use Upwork all the time. Upwork was like the, you know the CEO of Upwork, former CEO of Upwork, uh, was on my board of directors. Really? Explain what Upwork, Upwork is. That's just basically it's a freelance economy. You want anything done, you go online, you post it, yep. and you can pay like two, three dollars to get anything done. Really, yep. and and that sounds like a little, but it's actually a lot in a lot of the developing yeah. world. So I offer five dollars for every job, and sometimes it's like 
really quick. And you know, that's a, that's like a week's worth of pay in oh, some places. Oh my God. It, it was game changing. Yeah. In terms of opening up my eyes to that. And, and the, thing, it's it's the idea, it's like almost like Postmates, but for jobs. Yeah. So you want food, you get it right away on Postmates. You want, you know, you want a job done, you go on Upwork. You go on Upwork. And I, I think people are afraid because they think it's outsourcing to over, overseas. And David, I've been able it's to, ridiculous. yeah, I mean, I'm right now, so I'm running this festival company. And we're implementing a lot of processes and we have, we do about half a dozen events a year in the New York City area, a uh, major festival and then a couple. Well, why don't of we ones. go, why don't we, let's, let's, okay. Jump let's, into that? Well, let's first finish the story on c Well, the other thing I was going to say yeah. about that is that I've been using Upwork to help us oh, yeah. get a lot of things. It's an entrepreneur's yeah, dream totally. to have that. Totally. Let's go. Let's go first back into the journey. You 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 made the decision to sell your company. First of all, you raised a ton of money. Yeah, too much money. And 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 how was that? You had a lot of pressure on yourself. You were raising money. You were the mom and the dad. Yep. So you really did. You really did many jobs. Um, how was the? I mean, I I hated fundraising. I did that, but I raised most. I love of it. I raised most of my you money. Get a bunch of people to buy your bullshit. <laughs> yeah, but I raised most people don't know that I raised most of my money in the back of Zeke Brofman's bris, where I raised money where people didn't want to be at the bris piece. And someone asked me, "What am I doing?" And I raised four million dollars in the back of the bris, which you probably had a little bit more of a it's different, amazing. Uh, a different type of. I got to go to more, br- more uh, go to more brises. Yeah, more brises. <laughs> For so, a Gentile audience, a bris is where a Jewish boy gets circumcised. Yes, yes, yeah. and men do not like to be in that room when it's happening. Is that true? Yes, they oh. go to the back of the room. You know, I don't think I've ever been to one. Really? I mean, besides the one I had. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting very into yeah, the Yeah, well, this is good. So, yeah. so, okay, so so you you realize you started this company, you had mm. friends and family money, you had your own money you put into it. You pretty much put everything into it. Right? I did, yeah. I and, had no money in the bank. And then you um, got r- money from people. Yep. And then how did you sell the dream and convince people that they should take a just, shot on this. For the record, I put $10,000 in on my own money. That's all. And that's all that's I had. That's all you had. Yeah. But that's 100% yeah. of your net worth. Not, not, not to mention the sweat equity. Yeah. 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 And you worked endless hours. Yeah. What was your first fundraising experience? Tonight? Well, I went out and raised, um, I, I, I decided, so the first fundraising experience, I went to, I joined an incubator in DC uh, called The Fort, uh, run by Fortify Ventures. And it was basically like, it's like co-working space for startups that you get a little funding. And I got $25,000. And back then, you know, now we spend like $25,000 a day. Yeah. $25,000 is like amazing. Yeah. So I got that money and I was like, oh my God. So I was able to like start hiring people and I, you know, sell them the dream a little bit. So I brought in some people using that money. Then we got a follow on from the incubator of 75,000 because they kind of felt like we would do good. And then, um, so that was kind of like the first money in. And then I went to the an angel group in uh, University of Maryland called uh, Dingman Angels. And um, I kind of learned very quickly that angel investors like to, they, they employ a bit of group think. So when one angel investor and another one is in, you get the whole group. So I went and worked the room before I got there, reached out to a couple of people, got them interested. So that once I pitched the group, angel investors are people who write money to entrepreneurs, for, usually former entrepreneurs. Once I pitched the group, a couple of guys were like, oh, I'm in it already. And then we, so we raised half a million dollars that way. And then it came, came, you know, we did a few more rounds. What was your first board of directors meeting like with investors? I don't remember. You don't? No. I blacked out. <laughs> <laughs> because you had to do, it was a whole different thing, right? You know, the thing is that board of directors change over time. And, you know, one of the things I learned too late is that the best board meetings are the ones that happen before you, they start. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? You don't so want anything at the board meeting. No surprises. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, socialize all the ideas, get everybody's opinions. And the trick to that is don't, actually go over the slides. You have the slides for reference and you say, well, since I sent the slides before, everybody's reviewed it. Right. And no one has. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's like, Hey, everybody, you guys reviewed it, right? I mean, right, so right, right, right. let's just talk about other things. Right, right. And, and, and you know, the other thing I learned is that a board of directors gives you shares opinions, not directives for the most part. Right. Right. A leading events agency based in D.C., Lender has a global footprint. Since their founding in 1996, they have partnered with internationally recognized clients such as the Smithsonian Institute and the iconic National Cherry Blossom Festival to produce and manage innovative and experimental events that don't just engage, they inspire. To learn more about Lender Global events, visit lenderglobal.com. 
So that means that just because they said something, no matter how much you're scared of them, no matter what, that doesn't mean you have to do And they don't want to do the work. Of course not. But they, but they do, all, what I found at board of directors meetings, they like to add up how much this will be worth in 10 years. They can, yeah, they can do that math. But right now I'm focused on, focused on present value and, yeah. and maximizing that. Yeah. And um, obviously they're always thinking about enterprise value, but I'm thinking about today. And Okay, uh, so wait, you raised more money. How much is your total? What's your total? total raised about $23 million. And when it got to be big dollars, did it get more serious or did it get easier? You know, the hardest round was the A round because that goes from like startup to like, scale a little right, bit right and we had we were very fortunate to have the best venture capital firm in the world invest in us best of our venture partners they've done twitch and pinterest and skype and linkedin and etc so they know how to deal with mercurial entrepreneurs too it depends on the partner yeah our partner was great but it depends on the partner yeah so i can't speak for other partners right. but you know what a good experience but that's really school to hard knocks because nobody tells you, hey, this the board meeting is run this way. You gotta have to have a comp compensation committee that meets this time. These are the things the board needs to sign off on. These are the things they don't. You don't get that. There's no sure there's business school. Business school is to tell you how to run a board meeting. Right, right. Right. There's no CEO school. Right, right. Uh there's no like venture backed CEO school. Yeah. So what I you know, and I can at times my investors would get frustrated with me because I wouldn't do things how they expected it. Well, I'm like, God damn it. How am I supposed to know? Like nobody, I wasn't born with a CEO manual in my back pocket. Right. Right. But now in retrospect, I should have asked. Yeah. And I didn't ask because I was scared. I think that it, you're, it, you're young. I mean, it's, 38. It's yeah. all, but it's all new. It is all new, but I still should have been curious enough to ask. Yep. And you know, so many times in board directors meetings, you're scared about like showing your true colors and right. you're just, like, you're scared of like being vulnerable. Right. I know. I, I totally, I mean, I wish, I mean, I was involved with Prime Media, which we bought a hundred companies and then I sold my own company and I like all the stuff I didn't know. I was, yeah. I was surprised. Yeah. I was so badly you know, prepared. Totally. And so you have to think ahead and, and um, you don't, you don't know what you don't know. Is what mm-hmm. it comes down to. Okay. So that, so you did the company for a while, then you decided, okay, valuation's good. Let's, See if we want to sell it. How do you just say, okay, I'm going to sell my company? So we didn't really make it. So it was much of a process. We we had hired a banker to be an advisor. And every, that means that pretty much they got a small retainer. Um, a guy named Larry Phillips, who's become a good friend. Larry Phillips? Yeah. I work with Larry Phillips. From Stiefel? Yeah. Wait, how do you know Larry? He worked at Prime Media with me. Larry Phillips? You no, know Larry Phillips? Yeah, I think so. So, But I hired Larry. Larry gave us, you know, just like market, just market information, kind of, you know, advising. Uh, so every every quarter he'd come to the board meeting, give an update on like what's going on in the industry, who he's talked to, you know. And then we had an offer from Cvent. And generally, every time you raise a round, you want to kind of test the market. So you you know you go to potential buyers and you say, "Hey, I'm thinking about you know, companies thinking about selling." And ideally, the CEO is not doing it. You know, for somebody else doing it for you. Although when I've read some books recently, one book called The Outsiders about all these CEOs who are non traditional have done really well. What I've learned is that most of the CEOs have done most of the invest, most of the deals themselves. They never hired a banker, mm-hmm. which is interesting. Oh yeah. But anyway, so you go, you try to find. So when you're raising around, you go reach out to folks, and you're like, "Hey, um, we're thinking about raising around, but we'd be open to offers," because it's really the same thing, right? Yeah. You're selling. You're selling either all or most or some, a minority stake of your business, either in an equity round or whatever. Or a liquidity event. So, Steven reached out. We've been, I've known Reggie and Chuck and Nitin, who works at Corp Dev for years. Always really loved them. Always really respected them because they're like an entrepreneur's but, entrepreneur. But, but Reggie, I mean, Reggie sold his company the year before, two years before, or something. Well, Reggie never sold it. I mean, he sold a big part of it. He sold a big part of yeah. it, but he, but it's to a private. But he's still equity. He's still CEO. Yeah, he's still CEO, but he, but a private equity firm is doing a roll up of all of yeah, these uh, things in our industry, right? I'm not doing a roll up. They just they combined two companies, Lanyon and Cvent. But they bought they, Lanyon did a roll up previously. Yeah, but they bought, they bought Gather. They bought uh, they, in, they invested in Gather, they but, okay. but that's out of two different funds actually. Oh, it is okay. Yeah, so okay. you never know. But anyway, look, roll up or no roll up. I yeah, think whatever. they think Cvent's a great business, and they're yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, so um, Cvent reached out. They're like, we're interested in we're interested in buying. That was like August of eighteen. All I know is I was at uh, August of eighteen, and I was at um, IMAX right when they changed the sign. Yeah, that they had announced it right in the middle of IMAX. Yeah, we we planned that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I figured. So yeah, 
So they reached out. The price was right. The people were right. The geography was right. The customer overlap was right. And so you basically did that for a year. And uh, now there's a, a whole new life ahead of you. What does the future hold? Let's talk about your new thoughts about yeah. life post social tables. So I'm moving to New York. I've been in DC for the past decade. I'm from New York. I'm kind of, I really, New York is where I get the most sense of belonging. I really don't feel a sense of belonging in other places in the United States. So I'm excited to move back to New York. So that's personally, my mom's there. My good friends are there. But then over the summer, I actually invested in a um, event production company called Bang On NYC. They've been doing underground events in Brooklyn uh, for the past decade. New Year's Eve events, Halloween events, warehouse events, amazing stuff. We, they, they've been able to get talent before. That's kind of, it's really events for tastemakers. They, they're able to get talent before the talent really blows up. And how did you even find these guys? Um, I went to a music festival they produced yeah. randomly. It's actually a great story. So I went, I was on the way to New York driving and then my friend Matt calls me and he's like, Hey, um, there's a festival happening. This, this was a Saturday Memorial Day weekend last year. Festival happening. I want to go instead of going to New York. I'm like, sure. I reprogrammed my GPS, drove up to Lakewood, Pennsylvania, stopped by an old Navy to buy a couple sweaters and got to the festival. And I was like, this is incredible. And at the end of the night, on the third night, I was hanging out like it was super early in the morning. I took a photo with a bunch of random people on the dance floor. It's kind of like everybody in costume, kind of like, you know, was tired. And then a few weeks later, I, I then um, recognized one of the people that I took a photo of. Cause he's kind of like a memorable character. His name is Brett. And I was like, Hey man, I know you from this festival. He's like, Oh yeah, that's my festival. And I was like, I want to write you a check. You guys have something really special. Well, what was so special? Not to get into details, but you obviously well, it's an you event. I mean, it. we're talking you, about events, you right? You bought the biggest ticket in the place. I think, <laughs> I think there were, so there are many special things about Elements Festival, but I think the, the three things that for me are, it was a, you know, community is a word that's thrown around a lot, but because of its size, because of its location, it had a sense of community. This kind of like, it was like a bubble. It was a bubble. The phone didn't always work there. You were, connected the music the music sounded really good the scene was really nice the, 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 the scenery was really nice so you were in a bubble for those three days and you really got a sense of community and in turn got a sense of belonging with those people like-minded wherever they come from that I didn't get anywhere else that was the first thing the second thing is the production value uh, whether it's the talent they book the sound they produce the arts and performances they had, fire and, and just insane stuff. That you're, the stuff at Elements that happens today, you're not going to see in events for two or three, four years. So the production value and the, the, the art detailing. And um, the fifth one, it's our fifth one. The third, the third reason is because I had a fucking good time. <laughs> I just had a good well, fun time. Fun is a good thing. Yeah, yeah, I had a good time. I've been going to festivals my whole life. I've been to Bonnaroo. I've been, I've been to like big festivals, small festivals. And what does a good time look like for you? I'm not sure we can talk about that <laughs> on the air. But a good time is for the elements attendee. Yes, um, generic science. It's a place where there are really no rules. You mm -hmm. can be yourself. You're accepted. It's an exclusive community that is very inclusive. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of, it's both of those things. Right. It's, you there's pop-up music. It's like Burning Man in the Forest. Burning Man in the Forest. Yeah. It's really I mean, there's a, the people it. love going to this. They thing. do. And the benefit we have is that we're two hours outside of every metropolitan area in, in, in New England. Um, we're more affordable because you don't have to like pack for a week and, you know, get all this water and whatever else you need to do. We actually have a schedule. Burning Man doesn't have a schedule. It's kind of like pop-up, whatever. So, and it's less planning. So it's, why it's a good, they, good festival for beginners. Why did they want to have investors? And why did, why what made you decide to write a well, check? Well, I think they're probably regretting it now that they're working with me. But <laughs> <laughs> the they wanted investors because are, they, are you giving them um the who stuff or are you <laughs> I'm I'm throwing everything. I mean, these guys are going through a boot camp, man. Oh, no. And they're taking it on the chin. They're are just they? really good about it. Yeah. And they want to learn. That's why yeah. I invested in them at the yeah. end of the day, because these guys like they really want to get better. And they, they understand this opportunity. There's no other real, there's really no competition in the New England, in the, the Northeast, uh, when it comes to a regional festival. So they, they want to get better. They realize they're on the cusp of something and um, they want to grow. So, okay. So 
what's the plan for that? I mean, there's certain news that you want to share with us. There's really not many, much news. I mean, so I'm right now the interim CEO and we're talking about how I can potentially become on full time and we're just doubling in size. So last year we did about, you know, 4,000 tickets. We hope to double this year. It's not easy. It's really hard, especially when you're building a new product, a new festival. It's really hard to grow that much. We have a really big community that we've worked with for years, for 10 years that really knows us, knows our sound, knows our vibe. And you know, one of the things we were talking about earlier is that everyone in the event industry is doing kind of the same thing, even though they're doing it in different niches. What are the things you have brought to the table that you see that they're doing that they're learning yeah, I'll from give you, you the perfect example. They didn't know about social tables. And then the woman who does all the, you know, experience design, she was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. You can I, then change the way you They design. had no idea that social yeah. tables existed. That's yeah. one example. Yeah. Right. But everything is different between the consumer and the corporate world. You and I are we're in the, we were in the corporate Corp world. world, but it's going, I mean, it's all, it's working together. Yeah, it's, it, it is like, you know, even the ticketing systems are different. Yeah. You got C event in one side and then you got like event on the other, or you got C event on one side or whatever. And then you got like, we use Tixer. You yeah. ever heard of Tixer? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you know Tixer? Well, no, I saw it on your site. Yeah. yeah and I yeah. was saying, who the hell are these yeah, guys? Exactly. So it's like, and, and every festival has its own unique yeah. kind of need. So you need a different ticketing system. So that's different. The way you market is different. The every But the experience, the idea of finding fun. The idea doesn't change, which is what kills me. Yeah. Right? Like, but at the end of the day, you know, you have fast casual for when you're doing a lunch alone and you got like fine dining when you're doing groups. Yeah. So it it's makes all, sense. I mean, it's the gathering of people. Yeah. For it a is group the experience, which is kind of what your book is about, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, collaboration, how to be a collaboration artist. I mean, those, I mean, the Woodstock generation, look what that festival did. Look what absolutely festivals and, and everything is morphing together now. I mean, even Tim Armstrong is going to be doing a, uh, uh, selling uh, direct to consumer products using festivalization. I mean, there's all these new things that are happening that everything is morphing together. That's what we see. I mean, I see it because I go everywhere and I talk to a lot of people, what's, what's, but most people don't. Well, what's been humbling to me is like, you know, here I am like, you know, on social tables, I always walked around, spoke at conferences, whatever, whatever. And now I walk into space and I'm like, like, I've never heard of you. I'm yeah. not I'm like, what the hell are you? Yeah. And that's totally cool. Yeah. I mean, it, we, we're in our little niches. Totally. And, exactly. And, uh, you know, we're tribal. It's all tribal. The tribes don't and, mix. And you know, it's funny you say tribe because that's what we call the people at at, at uh, Elements Festival. And the way we market is actually, we figured out the tribes that attend yeah. our festival. And then we, we make sure that there are features and benefits that talk to what their needs are. Right. right. And what we're doing, because we're a camping festival, we're, what we will be introducing soon is the idea where you, a vibe village where you can choose your vibe and then live amongst people who share that vibe. How, how cool is, is that? What is the experience? How, it's three days? It's three days. And it's Morally weekend, Friday through Monday. Oh, and so it's a like electric carnival and all those kinds of things. In this well, those same. are very commercial, David. Those are commercial. So how do you explain to the average person we are a the multi -day, different yeah. niches? So we're a multi-day multi arts and music festival. Our tagline is your ticket to utopia. Okay. We have a much smaller budget than EDC, but we have people who are much more passionate going and participating and performing. Right. And the difference is that you don't get like the Calvin Harris's. Although he'd be pretty cool to book. Well, you could. We could, but we get people who are just about to blow up or will blow up because we are so good. One of our competitive advantages is being able to identify musical talents and getting out of them. What is the ticket price? What is the cost of entry to these kind of, your kind of- Depends on the on what you go and what right. package you choose, yeah. but it's about $250 for a, a three-day right. pass. And Lollapalooza is probably what? I don't even know her. Or they're roughly all the same. They're all the of, same. Yeah, but you, know, you get the VIP experience, you get the it, different experiences. But you know, again, like, do you want to go to a festival that, you know, is featured on, you know, that, that has a uh, Anheuser-Busch sponsoring? Right, right. Or do you want to go to one that has Negro Modelo sponsoring it? So you're really going, you're really, you know, people are choosing their sort of their vibe that they like. It, you know, it, exactly. It's like, it is, look, we're a big tent. Everybody's welcome. And it is a little bit more of a, Bespoke experience, right? Because you're going to the forest. You're not. It's Lala Blues is a city festival. Yeah, yeah. You sleep in a hotel. Yeah, right. Coachella. We, right. So we actually have cabins. Yeah. And you can rent cabins for up to eighteen people. Well, it's like going to summer camp. I did this. No. So ours is in a summer camp. It isn't summer. And camp. funny enough, our venue is right next to the summer camp I used to go to as oh, a kid. Wow. Yeah. So it's this Jewish sleepaway camp because I mean, Jews from New York always go to sleepaway yeah, camp, yeah, yeah. and you get a cabin yeah. with up to eighteen mates, and you got 
there's all kinds of ways to experience it. And Sounds like fun. Yeah, it's so much fun. And people people like put up signs in their cabins and they call the name of the cabins. Each village is going to have a flag. So you're going back to camp. I'm going back to camp. That's yeah. uh, you know what? That's a great summary. Yeah. In a great What are you up to these days, Don? Well, I'm going back going to camp. Back to camp. Going yeah. back. <laughs> Well, you know, it's so funny that, you know, when we're both of us are sort of in a position, you got to do it a lot younger than I did, of doing what the hell you want to do. Yeah, but the key is to know what you want to do, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, the key is to know. But also, it's not being attached to the past. The thing about events that's really I'm thinking about these days is like, God, so much work goes to so little time. Yeah, yeah. But so, the memories last forever. The, 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly. The tr- right, so we're all about, tr- uh, um, that my thing is now transformational experiences. Oh, not yeah. To, not just experiential oh, stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how do you make it transformational? Right, I'm working on this thing because I was transformed when I went on Memorial Day weekend. Right, right. Now, how do we? And then, so what is? So what's really cool about what we do is we have multiple event products that we offer throughout the year that people can experience, kind of lake what we call Lakewood life, which is the festival. So there's definitely one way to extend the life the lifespan. Was Lakewood where the um, the big thing crashed in? Uh World War II, the big helium balloon was that. That was like with New Jersey. I'm sorry. That's a big yeah, they thing. were actually on the way to their festival. They were on the way to the festival, and they, <laughs> they were jamming a little yeah, too yeah, hard. Yeah, 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 jamming a little. So too that's hard. interesting. So, so life is good. Life's good. And this sounds like a real passion for you. It is passion because I am passionate about it because I am really infatuated with how do you. How do you give people? You know, I did when I, you know, I did Simon Sinek's why find my, find yeah, my yeah, why. Yeah. I did my own one, yeah. and mine was to create connected communities that give people a sense of belonging. Well, you're doing that, and I did it at social tables, and I'm doing it at Elements, and I'm going to do it at, in, in my new home, bringing people together. And um, I think that that's what you and I share, and that's right. We, well, that's why you're a true yeah. collaboration artist. I mean, and it is an art. It is an art. It's, so, an, it's what, not so more than a. What, make, what makes what's the difference there? Well, because you don't know what will work or not, but it's like, I believe that events and meetings and things like that, we're like the razor, uh, you buy the razor, but the blade, you know, and how you shave and how you do it is part of the art. Um, it's like creating music. You can have all the musical instruments you work, want, but the art is how do you connect people in ways using certain techniques, uh, like letting people talk to each other and, totally. and, so- and raising your hand and seeing people participate more and, sitting them at the right place to do the social engineering. And that's why like, for example, again, in our festival, it's like, a, it's not just a stage. It's a 360 immersive stage mm-hmm. where you have a tree house and like a stand and a place to dance if you're a VAP and a place to stand if you're in GA and the dance if you're in GA and you have art all around you. Right. And you can just experience the music in so many different ways with so many different groups. What is, what, what, what about the weather? <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind, how, if it rains, it, nobody cares. So it rained last year Yeah. for one day, got muddy. Didn't stop people anybody. And we got insurance money back. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. That's, that's good. Yeah. So how do people go to this festival? What do they do? Well, you got to buy a ticket. Where? How do you do it? You go to elementsfest.us. Um, that's plural. Elementsfest.us. And you got a ticket. If you have any questions, info at elementsfest.us. Um, I just hired somebody who was actually manning that. Uh, oh, okay. All the time. We didn't have anybody monitoring the inbox. Okay. <laughs> we were kind of, everybody was doing it, it was shared. So we're kind of delineating work. Could and, we, can we create a cabin for event organizers? That'd be absolutely. <laughs> I, sure. We can create an event organizing village. You definitely bring the, bring the tribe. Maybe we can give, old a, tribe we give a, a new backstage, tribe. a backstage yes. Um, tour. Yes. That's an awesome idea. Yeah. Let's I'm do open, it. totally so, open to it. Well, Don, thank you so much for thank you, everything, David. for um, everything that you've done I can done go all me. day, man. This is fun. Yeah, this is fun. Anyway, we've got to stop because people get bored. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they'll just do this out. Understandable. And, uh, or, they're, or, gonna, or they'll crash in their car listening. No, you know? no, please don't do that. Get a Tesla. It drives itself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, David and Don. What a fascinating career turn. And I just feel there's something about the type of person who goes to destination music festivals. They found their tribe. And we will be sure to keep an eye on the Elements Music and Arts Festival, which takes place May 22nd to 25th in Lakewood, Pennsylvania. And check out our show notes to read our innovator's profile of Don in 2014. My editorial plug for this week is our coverage of the South Beach Wine and Food Festival. Fun sponsor activations, some delicious looking cocktails and food dishes, and more from our correspondent Tracy Block. You can see additional images from the event on our Instagram. 
One note, the festival did not make accommodations for coronavirus, but the founder, Lee Brian Schrager, told us that if it had been held one week later, it would have been a consideration for sure. So there's some food for thought as you think about your own events and how coronavirus might be affecting your plans. Well, thanks to Rebecca Pakbis, who leads our audience development, Claire Hoffman, our editorial liaison, and our producer, Dave Nelson of The Lens Group. We'll be back next week. Gather on. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a rating and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at Gather Geeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on.